her singing at revival. She said she don't sing at revivals, but I really appreciate that. That was a blessing. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. Try not to be too long-winded. It's kind of like the preacher. He always, the way he kind of timed his messages, he'd put one of those lifesaver things in his mouth. And whenever it would dissolve, he'd know it was about time to be finished. Well, he always reach in his pocket and grab it. Well, you know how you'll get these, these buttons, you know, with these suits and stuff? Well, he reached in, he didn't know it, and he put that button in his mouth. He preached about 2 o'clock in the afternoon before he realized something's wrong. I won't be that long tonight. It's kind of like one guy, he get to preaching. I was telling the folks uh, yesterday, the little baby was back there sleeping. I said, well, you know, sometimes I have that effect on people. Um, there was this man, and he always sat on the front pew, and he would always get to nodding off during church. And so the preacher, he started, you know, trying to do some things to keep him up. You know, sometimes he'd pound on the pulpit and move around a little bit, and and, and none of those things were really getting him. So he, he got up, and he grabbed a hymn book, and he got to preaching and getting a little bit louder. And he'd get over there close to him, kind of waving it, trying to keep the guy open. And lo and behold, if he didn't slip. And the thing hit the man in the head. And he nodded a little bit that like that. And he did to his wife. He said, hit me again. I can still hear him. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have something worth hearing tonight. We know from the Bible it's definitely worth hearing. Ruth chapter number 1, we'll begin here in verse number 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. My text will be from verse 18. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded. Ruth had a made-up mind. That's what I want to preach about just for a little bit tonight. Preacher, would you ask the Lord to bless the message for us? Our Father, we come to thee in the name, speak with your brother in the name of him of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We come here for one purpose, Lord, that's to hear from you from the Word of God. Anoint thy servant in the power of the Holy Spirit. Give him the illumination, God, that he needs to bring forth this great discernment that you want us to know. 
then Holy Spirit convicting us of what's wrong and, or if something's right in our eyes and our, in your eyes, then get us to praise, to praise you. Move mightily, open the hearts up. There may be a soul in here tonight that needs you in salvation. Well, bring them under divine conviction. We'll rejoice and give you glory. I, I come, Father, for one purpose. I come to hear from you from the Word of God and drive back the poles and tires of hell, God, and let us hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, we're all familiar, I think, with the passage and how that the times in which this occurs is the period of the judges. And a great summary is found in the end of the book of Judges where it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. This was a period of apostasy. We see it not just in the spiritual sense, but also we see it in the physical sense where judgment fell on Bethlehem. The house of bread became a place where you couldn't get any bread. And a famine had hit the land, and Elimelech, he had left, and he left the place where God had put him, where God had given a promise to his people, and he went, basically, as we would say, out into the world. Elimelech left Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread, and he basically chose the flesh over the spirit. He chose carnality over Christ, and he chose pleasure over over principle. Now I want to submit to you tonight, I don't think it was all Elimelech's decision. The reason I say that, because if that was the case, as soon as he died, she would have went right back to Bethlehem. But she stayed. It might have been that she was on the same page with her husband. Maybe she even persuaded her husband and said, look honey, the, they're paying a couple of dollars an hour or more in Moab. You know what? You can get some overtime in Moab. We don't go to church much on Sunday anyway, so why not just move to Moab? They have some really good schools over there in Moab. Who knows? But we know that Elimelech got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. It's a sad tragedy when you think about it. You think about what took place here, and it just hit me today as I was looking over this message how that the odds of her husband dying... And then both of her sons dying like that. What a tragedy. And I know some of you in here have probably been through tragic death in your life. There's a difference in tragic, unexpected death and death that is something that's to be expected. And sometimes even when someone is suffering and they're saved, it's something that we look forward to for that person to depart and be with Christ. But boy, a tragic death, it hits you hard. And I can't imagine what she was going through. And you know, when people go through things like that, we need to try to be as sensitive as we can. Amen. Don't just run in there and throw Romans 8.28 on them. Yeah. That's Amen. not going to help them. Romans 8.28 is true, but they might not need to hear a sermon. They might just need a hug. Amen? Yeah. I was reading about this story where this used to be a mill town, so there was this mill running, and this man had gotten killed on the job. They normally had a guy that was kind of the liaison between the employees and the people. Because back in the days, you know, they'd build all the little the, the houses right around the mill. They had the country store that they all had credit in, all those things. And this guy that was the liaison was out. So they had to get word to the man's wife that the guy had died. So they got one of the guys, and he's kind of known as a rough guy. They said, look now, we know how you are. So when you go talk to Mrs. Jones, you need to let her down easy. You need to be sensitive to her. He says, where does she live? And they gave him the house number. He went knocking on the door. She answered the door. He says, is this Widow Jones' house? She says, Widow Jones, I'm not a widow. He goes, that's what you think. <laughs> that's not the way to yeah. let somebody down easy. Can you imagine the tragedy that took place in Naomi's life, losing her husband and then losing her two sons? What an awful thing. Well, as we see here in verse number 7, it looks like both Orpah and Ruth have decided to go back with Naomi. It appears that way. Maybe I'm just kind of reading in between the lines a little bit, but I think they walk along the way, and maybe Naomi begins to think about preparing these Moabite women, Gentiles, 
for Jewish life. Amen. Maybe she starts thinking some things and saying, you know what, uh, you know, the Lord God of Israel has given us some promises and he's given us some laws and these are some things. And maybe as she was kind of preparing them and recounting some things, maybe Ruth and, or uh, Ruth and Naomi noticed Orpah's kind of lagging behind a little bit. She's having second thoughts. Maybe it's at that point, verse 8 happens. And Naomi just turns and says, look, y'all just need to go back. I mean, you're not going to be able to go into the tabernacle to worship. I mean, you're going to be ostracized. I mean, you're looked upon as the filth of this world. You're not going to fit in. Maybe you just need to go back. You know, here's a woman that's supposed to be a Jewish saint. And of course, we would consider her what we would call an Old Testament saint. Especially as you look into the line of King David, and there's Naomi. Amen. But think about what she's saying here. You would have thought when Orpah began to look back, she would have said, remember Lot's wife. You would have thought as an older, mature lady, she might would have encouraged them to go and try to find mercy with the God of Israel. Yeah. Go and try to find help and kind of slide under the wings of the God of Israel like Ruth does eventually. Yeah. But she's not thinking spiritually at this point. Let me just say this for some of you that may be looking up to older Christians. Make sure you're looking up to an older spiritual Christian. Because there are some older carnal Christians that might give you some very bad advice. There's a lot of older Christians that give some bad worldly advice. And you need to make sure you check it with the Bible. What does the scripture say? Old men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. So she's not at the place now. She should be giving advice. She's, she's messed up spiritually herself. How's she going to help them? Amen. And so this is a bad situation. Of course, we know what happens with Orpah. But when Naomi talks to them, you'll notice in verses 12 and 13, 11, 12, 13, this is basically what she says. Girls, at your age, getting married is the most important thing in the world. Number two, she says, there's no hope for you in Judah of getting married. Number three, she basically says, getting married is more important than who you marry. I mean, that's, this is what she's telling them. Amen. But you know, Ruth has already made up her mind. Ruth has already got her head set. You'll notice in verse number 18, she's steadfastly minded. That word steadfast means to be fixed in direction, steadily directed, firm, resolute, firmly established, not wavering. She's got her mind made up. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 that we ought, to be, we ought to serve the Lord with a steadfast mind, unwavering. And when your mind's made up and fixed on something, that means you can't be changed. I'm a little weary of, of some preachers, and sometimes, a lot of times they're younger preachers, but you'll hear them make statements like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering about this doctrine. And I wonder about that doctrine. You better get some things nailed down. Yeah, Look, I know there are some things that are abstract, and I know, you know, we're not going to argue about who's going to be making umbrellas for the millennial reign of Christ. I mean, I get all that. There are some things that are abstract, and I'm not going to fight with you about it. But there are some things that are absolute, and you better nail them down. You better be steadfast on them. You better be set on them, set in concrete, fixed, and not able to be moved. She got her mind made up. I remember when I was growing up, my neighbor had some horses. And um, we'd come home from school, and he'd go, and we'd get on those horses. And because we didn't want to you know, spend all the time to have to put the saddles on and everything, we just rode them bareback. We get them on, we ride through the woods and things like that. And I remember one particular day we're riding, and um, I was kind of a lot smaller than him, so I'm on this full-size horse. I'm a little kid, and I barely fit on the horse good enough. And we got close to the barn. I guess they thought it was feeding time. And that horse got a made-up mind. He tucked his head like that, and he took off boogity, boogity, boogity toward that barn. Man, I tripped. I, I slid on that horse. I fell underneath. I was on his neck, holding on to his mane with my feet dangling and trying to stay up so he, I didn't fall under and get trampled. And I held on for dear life where he made it all the way down to the barn. And I, he dropped me off right, on, right in front of the gate there. 
That horse, there's nothing I can do. He tucked his head. I couldn't pull him. I couldn't tug him. And as I was trying to pull him and tug him, I just flipped around and, and, and held on for dear life. He had a made-up mind. Yeah. Uh, any of you got cats? I got a dog and a cat. I tell you what, the cats, you can't teach a cat nothing. You can tell a cat can do something, you can kick it away from something, it'll come right back to it. Kick it, kick it, kick it, kick it. Just st stupid. I don't know what it is. Just a made up mind about things. But you know, we need to have a steadfast mind about this thing we call serving Jesus Christ. You say, well, preacher, I, I, you, you can tell I've got a made up mind because I'm here at church. Well, maybe you do. I want to encourage you to keep a made up mind. Maybe you do. Maybe you need to just drive that rut a little bit deeper. Make sure it's the right kind of rut because you've got to be careful with ruts. Ruts are just like a grave with both ends kicked out. You've got to be careful. That ruts can turn into rotting if you're not careful. Yeah. But look, we need to have some trails made. We need to have some old paths driven. We need to have a set mind that's made up. I want us to look at this. First thing I want you to see in verse number 14, notice that she did not kiss. She clave. She didn't kiss. She clave. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. Many people, they kiss. Now, a kiss is a, it shows a, 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 an expression of love. It may be an expression of love, but it could be a lack of action. You can give a kiss just being superficial. Uh, they have in, in ancient times, a lot of times the, the uh, peasants would kneel down and kiss the feet of the rulers, of the kings. Well, there's no telling what they said about them when they were behind closed doors. <laughs> You can have a kiss of affection. It can be outward, an outward symbol, but there can be no inward affection toward it. It can just be superficial. Judas Iscariot kissed Jesus Christ. So you have these kisses, and here we have a woman that kisses. And you know, there's a lot of Christians, they'll throw a Sunday morning kiss at God occasionally. They might throw a kiss to God occasionally and maybe read the proverb of the day. Or maybe throw a kiss and say a prayer over a meal. But a kiss is not the same as cleaving. Yeah. That word cleave can mean torn apart or it can mean to join together. It means to be stuck to. And Ruth is basically saying, Naomi, you're not going to get rid of me. I'm stuck to you. Yeah. Orpah might kiss you, but you're never going to see her again. She goes off the pages of Scripture just as fast as she comes on the pages of Scripture. Yeah. But Ruth winds up in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Yeah, Few cleave. You know, many were preached to in Noah's day, but only eight got on the ark. Yeah. Abraham and Lot both left out of Haran. But you know what happened to Lot? He wound up in Sodom. Twelve sons of Jacob, but only one, Joseph, is the one that's the right kind of a son that's yeah. not wicked like yeah. his other brothers. Amen. Many left out of Egypt, but you know what happened at Kadesh Barnea. They got to a place where they began to doubt God's promises. All they could see were giants instead of God. Yeah. And out of the 12 spies, only two of them said, we can go in and conquer yeah. the land. When you think about it throughout the scriptures, you see it over and over. You think about all the warriors that Saul had. He had 3,000. David had 600. And he really had 400 out of the 600 that were the big warriors. Many false prophets of Baal. And of course, you got Elijah. And I know that they got the 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee. But there's Elijah there standing in front of the 400 prophets of Baal. And then there's also 400 prophets of the groves. Yeah. Christ had the 70 disciples. But in John 6, verse number 66... Many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Amen. Amen. Then he said unto the twelve, will you also go away? And out of those twelve, Judas betrayed him. And then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So you begin to think about this. Many people do kiss, but few cleave. You know, there are many people that will come up and they will show some signs of Christian growth, but very few will consistently grow throughout their Christian life. Amen. Now, many of you, I'm sure, especially probably you ladies, I saw somebody here Sunday, I think it was, you had some, who was that that had the, you had the plant food, didn't you have it? Somebody had the, okay, you have that feed and you feed those plants. 
Now, you have to be careful not to put too much of that fertilizer on those plants. You can go out there and get the bloom booster and all that kind of stuff, and you get start getting your pansies and stuff in the wintertime and plant those things. You can get them to bloom real quick, but you can get a lot of real quick growth, and then they can burn out. They'll bloom out and burn out. There's a lot of Christians, they start off, and they bloom out, and then they burn out. The Lord's looking for consistent Christian growth. Not just somebody to throw a kiss and to show up and have and have a little bit of excitement, kind of like in the parable of the sower where the, 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 uh, the uh, seed springs up really fast, but it doesn't have any root. It doesn't last. He's looking for somebody to cleave. Amen. Are you in this thing for the long haul? I really appreciate preachers. I know there's some preachers in here tonight. I appreciate a preacher here preaching for over 50 years. Well, you've been preaching for longer than that. That's a great testimony to me. I've been pastoring my church for 17 years, which seems like a long time sometimes, and other times it seems like just yesterday. Yes, it does, brother. Sometimes it's just like that. But I think what the Lord's looking for is somebody that'll say, you know what, I'm going to serve Jesus today, and I'm going to put my foot in front of the foot, and I'm going to cleave today. I'm going to be mindful today to serve Jesus Christ. One day at a time, as the old song says, she didn't kiss, she clave. You know, I think the illustration of the parting of the ways, and of course, Dr. Ruttman has a great message on that. I'm sure some of you probably saw it. And you think about the parting of the ways, there's Ruth and there's Orpah. I think about two guys walking down the road, and here they are with a hunting dog. They're going down the road, and they're coming down to a place where the road splits. And here you got both guys walking, and you can see from behind, there they are. And you see the dog in between them, but you really don't know who the dog belongs to. Until they get to the parting of the ways. Yeah. And when they get to the parting of the ways, the one fellow walks off like this, and that dog follows him. Then you know who the dog belongs to. Yeah. And sometimes you really can't tell about Christians. After a while you can, but sometimes it takes some time yeah. to find out if they're really going to stick with it. Thank God for those that get saved. It's a blessing. Hallelujah. I'm glad people get saved, and sometimes you see people get saved, and that's all you're going to see of it. Unfortunately, sometimes you don't get to see a lot of Christian growth. That's a sad thing. Yep. Look, I'm not saying those people aren't saved. You know, you say, well, you know, no change, no change. Okay, you be the, you know, you be the judge. Yeah. I'm going to let God be the judge. They trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're Amen. saved. Amen. Passed from death unto life. You say, well, where's the fruit? Well, where's your fruit? Amen. You know, pharisaical fruit's not very good in my opinion. Amen. But Amen. nonetheless... You know what's good to see? It's good to see when somebody has a made up mind and they're serious about this thing. And they take it from one step to another. Too many Christians are lukewarm in our modern day and age. We all have a tendency to do that. Hot or cold. Make up your mind. He says in the book of Revelation, I wish you were cold or hot. In other words, the Lord's like, I either want you serving me or just going out in the world. That sounds hard and that sounds harsh, but that's what he says. Either be cold or be hot. Get in or get out. Sometimes I genuinely pray this. I say, Lord, send us the people you want us to have. Send us the people you want. Take away the ones you don't. So that's a hard prayer. I don't love backdoor revivals. Don't get me wrong. I don't think people look better leaving than they do coming. Don't get me wrong at all. But you know what? We need people that are serious. People that have their mind made up. Too many Christians are pulled this way. One day they're in the world. One day their affections are toward the things of this life. And then maybe they start thinking about the Bible. And they pull out the Bible every now and again. And they think about Jesus every now and again. But their mind is not fixed on Jesus Christ. Their mind is fixed on the things of this world. The Bible says set your affection on things above. Not on things on the earth. Amen. Just pull both ways. Back in the 40s there was one of the most awful tragedies that took place on a train in Spain. The El Toro Tunnel. And it was one of those trains that had an engine on both sides. And they got in this tunnel and the engine that was pulling it failed. Well, because of communication problems, the other engineer on the other side, he, to get out of the tunnel, he got to moving and he started pulling. Well, as soon as he did, the engine started back on this side. And so unbeknownst to either conductor there, they're both pulling. And they didn't get out of the tunnel and the carbon monoxide poisoned and killed hundreds of people on the, on the train. In that tunnel. That's a great picture of a lot of Christians. are pulled 
They don't have their mind made up either way. They're in the world and they're trying to serve God and they're being pulled and they're just slowly getting poisoned to death. You're not going to find fulfillment and peace in the middle. You're not going to find it in the world. You're only going to find it serving Jesus Christ. Do you have a made up mind? Your mind made up? Verses 15 to 17. Notice not only she didn't kiss, she clave. Notice, very simple tonight, nothing deep. Notice she didn't go back, she went forward. Verse 15, behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back under her people. You know, it's easy to backslide. Somebody said, what do you do to backslide? Just don't do anything. <laughs> you backslide. That, back, that word backslide is an Old Testament term from the book of Jeremiah. The, the idea is a backsliding heifer. You picture this big fat cow trying to walk up an embankment, and the rain's coming down, and the mud, and it gets slippery, and it slips, and... <laughs> The legs go out from under, and this big blubber hits the, hits the thing and just slides back down the hill. That's the tight picture. Fat cows and backslidden Christians have a lot in common. <laughs> it's so easy for all of us to revert backwards. That's our tendency. You know, we've had the old man longer than we've had the new man. An old man says, I'm the firstborn. You ever notice in the Bible how the firstborn never gets it right? The first man, Adam, is of the earth, earthly. The second man's the Lord from heaven. Yeah. Cain wasn't right. Abel was right. You know, it's, uh, it's Isaac, not Ishmael. It's Jacob, not Esau. Yeah. You go around there, it's David, not Saul. Yeah. It's the new man, not the old man. That old man was first, and he tries to claim preeminence in your life. And it doesn't take too much for you just to go back, yep. to revert to habits. I'm telling you, breaking habits is hard to do. You know, they, the uh, psychologists, they have all these different ideas. You know, so many days you do this and you break a habit. Just from the text, I'll tell you how to break, it, break a habit. Just get your mind made up. Very simple way to look at it. But Ruth had her mind made up. In other words, she had already burned the bridges, kind of like Elisha. You remember what Elisha did? He's, he's there when Elijah comes, and he uh, puts his mantle on him, and he calls him. And um, Elisha's there plowing with the oxen, and he with the twelfth. And he says, well, let me first go back and tell my parents uh, goodbye. And you know what he did? He took those oxen, and he sacrificed them. He basically burned his bridges. Yes. That's what you call full commitment. Yeah. It's kind of like you're going down the road and you're trying to figure out, okay, which direction do I go? Which direction do I go? Here's the exit. I need to either take the exit or not. You can't just go in between. you got to take the exit or don't take the exit. Be committed. Yep. When you stood at the altar and you got married, you made a commitment. You said, I do. I'm making a commitment. What do they say? Till death yep. do us part. Yep. That's, right. That's what it means. Yep. Thick or thin. Health, health, good health, bad health. Good finances, bad finances. Good days, bad days. Weird ways, not so weird ways. We are peculiar people, all of us. And if you can't commit and make a commitment to submit yourself under an authority then you're never going to be able to make a commitment to serve Jesus Christ because we are all to be submitted under His authority. Amen. Once you can go ahead and make that commitment to be submitted to His authority, then it's kind of like John said. Sometimes it's hard to understand, but John said in 1 John, he says, His commandments are not grievous. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh man. John's like, it's no big deal. You love Jesus, what's the big deal? It's easy to keep His commandments. Yeah. But you know, if you're in fellowship with Jesus, it's a whole lot easier yeah. to do what you're supposed to do because you want to do. You want to do what you're supposed to do. I want to come to church, man. This is the I'm going yeah. down the road thinking, man, what a privilege it is yeah. for me to be able to come to church. And why in the world would you want me to preach to you? I mean, who am I? I am nothing, man. A glorified dirt ball. And here I am being able to preach the Bible to you and hopefully give something that can help you. It is a joy and an honor. I get to do this. It's not, well, I've got to go to church. It's kind of like the story. You ever heard the story of the mother and she went to wake up her son. And she said, son, it's 845. We got to get up and go to church. 
He's like, Ma, I don't want to go to church. <sighs> Why do I have to get up and go to church? She said, son, number one, you're 40 years old. Number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> man, I, I like going to church. I love going to church. Yes, man. I love my church. And I love my church family. I have the best church in the world. Nothing against you folks. But I believe I have the best church in the world. It's kind of like uh, the, uh, there was these deacons and they, um, they got talking to their preacher. And the preacher's like, look, we've got to have a meeting because y'all ain't doing right. I mean, here you are, you're not living right, and you're supposed to be deacons of this church, and you represent the church, and I'm telling you what, uh, y'all not doing good. They said, well, preacher, why, what do you expect from us? We pay you to do good, and we're just good for nothing. He goes, yeah, that's right, you're good for nothing. <laughs> I love going to church. I love reading the Bible. There's some things that it's hard for my flesh to do, like witnessing sometimes. But when I step out there and I do it and I'm able to do it, I enjoy it when I do it. And I'm glad I did it. I gave some tracks to some guys today and they didn't want them, but I left them with them anyway with a smile. And hopefully they read them. I could tell they didn't, you know, didn't want anything to do with it. But, you know, if we can change our want to, half the battle's won. Ruth had her mind made up. Orpah could do what she wanted to do. Orpah was not going to bring her down. If you have a problem, you have such lack of leadership skills in your life, I'm telling you, you better get around some people that got their mind made up to serve Jesus. You better not be around any lukewarm people because they are going to drag you down. You know the old story. It's a whole lot easier if you're standing up here for you to pull me down than it is for me to pull you up. And so if you're that personality, and nothing wrong with that, there's a lot more people or followers than leaders, you better get around some people that are going to push you and lead you to love Jesus more. You need to hang around somebody that's more spiritual than yourself. Hang around somebody that draws you, and when you get around them, you think, man, what a blessing. And you get around them and you think about Jesus. That's one reason I like to meet people, not because I'm a people person, because I'm really not that much of a people person. But you know what I like to do? I like to listen to people talk about the Lord and the things the Lord's doing in their life. Amen. Man, it's just a blessing to me because I get to see God doing some things. And man, your personality and things that God's doing in your life can, can point me to Jesus Christ. I like to be around that because I need that. Orpah, she just kissed Ruth Clay. Orpah went back. You know what Ruth did? She went forward. In order to do this, she had to release the past. Her old man was dead. It was over. She had a mother and father, but her old man, as you would say, as you would say her husband was dead. She released the past. There was a lady meeting with a counselor about her ex-husband. And she was having problems and things. And she started meeting with this counselor. She said, look, you know, I'm having all these problems. And he's really coming between the relationship that I have with my son. And the counselor said, well, ma'am, how old is your son? Well, my son's 32 years old. Well, how long have you been divorced? We've been divorced for 17 years. Uh, okay. Not to say, look, let me say this. I mentioned tragedy and, and different things. And divorce is like tragedy. It really is. But there's some things you don't get over, some things you just get through. A lot of times we tell people, look, you're going to get over it. Well, you might not ever get over it. There are some things you go through in your life, they will put their mark on you, and it will make you into the person that you'll be the rest of your life. And there's nothing you can do to change that. But God can help you to get through that thing. And Orpah, I mean, Ruth was able to release her past. It did not mean she was going to forget the love she had for her husband. It did not mean she was going to forget her husband and all that she went through those years ago. But it did mean she had to go forward. Amen. I'm telling you, Christian, if you're going to serve Jesus Christ, you are going to have to go forward. Yep. Look, nostalgia is a good thing. It's a neat thing. You got to have it. I think... Uh, I forget the actual who the, the quote's attributed to, but those who do not learn their lessons of the past are destined to repeat them. That's said over and over again, and it's very true. And you see that. When people don't learn the lessons of history, they oftentimes fall back in those same traps. And so we need to learn from our past. And you go back and you look, but nostalgia can pull you down because it can put you in a false reality. 
We are not in the 1970s. Amen. Amen. We're not there. We're not in the 1950s. We're not in the 1920s. We're not in the early 2000s anymore. Right. I'm telling you, we've got to let the past go. There was an old man in, or up in the Kentucky area, and a bad storm came through, and it blew down a bunch of trees, and there was this one old pear tree that had been on that property for years, and he had grown up on that property. His dad had lived there, and he lived on that property. Now his grandkids were in the area, and they all came up there, and they, that pear tree was just a, a symbol of their past. And the storm came through and just blew that thing right over during pear picking season. They came out and they said, Dad, Granddad, what are you going to do? You know, just your, your old pear tree's blown down. And they'd have old photos where he'd be in that picture and you'd see that old pear tree. I mean, this thing was ancient. And he says, well, you're right. This old tree's a part of my past. What are you going to do, Granddad? He, was, he said, we're going to pick the fruit and we're going to burn what's left. Go back, pick the fruit from the past, and burn what's left. Amen. Forward forward she had to release the past and she had to reach for the future you know an airplane doesn't have reverse <laughs> the safety that an airplane has is in forward and upward motion that's the safety of an airplane Amen. you need that forward and upward motion Ruth didn't go back. She went forward. And finally, I want you to see in verses 16 and 17. Ruth didn't plan. She trusted. Ruth didn't plan things out. In verse 16, she said, Entreat me not to leave thee or return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die. There will I be buried. She didn't plan where she was going to live. She just knew wherever Naomi was, there she was going to be. She didn't plan what her future was going to be. She didn't plan where she was going to die. Naomi, wherever you die, that's where I'm going to die. She didn't plan. She just trusted. Amen. I'm not telling you to be foolish. I know you have to set some things in order with your life and your estate and all those kind of things. I understand that. Those who fail to plan, plan to fail. I get that. But as Christians, we are called to live by faith. Last time I checked, we're independent Baptists. We're not charismatics. Amen. So I know it's the will of God for me to stop. And do you all have Krispy Kreme donuts up here? I saw a Dunkin' Donuts. Do you all have Krispy Kreme too? Yeah. I need to find one of those. Um, it's like I knew it was the will of God for me to park and pull into the Krispy Kreme donuts because it had the hot donut sign on. Yeah. Well, you drove around the block 15 times. To see it. We're not charismatics. We're not looking for all these signs. We have to live by faith. You got saved by faith. Faith in what God said about Jesus Christ. We have to live by faith. She didn't plan. She trusted. She realized some of her past mistakes. I don't know how many plans her and, and uh, Chilion may have had. I'm assuming... I don't know if her husband was Chilion or Malon. I don't know how many plans they might have had. Maybe they were eventually going to get out of that little rental and get them a house and maybe even get them a little white picket fence and get them a couple youngins and have a little dog. And I don't know what kind of plans they might have had. You know, typically speaking, I'm nearly 50 years of age. You can't tell it. But I have learned in my life things rarely turn out how you think they're going to turn out. Amen. You younger people in here, if you can go ahead and get a hold of that truth, I think it'll help you. Don't get your roots too deep down here. I don't know how much she had planned in the past. Maybe she realized some past mistakes, but maybe she was willing to rest in some of God's promises. Maybe Naomi had told her some about the right that she would have for a kinsman redeemer. According to the Old Testament law, she had a right. Maybe she told her some things along those lines and maybe she was beginning to trust. You ever read a novel? Maybe you read a book and you read one chapter and it's just awful. Maybe you see and you see some things in the main characters and you, you're reading this and you're thinking, man, this thing's, you got it in your mind how the story's going to end. But then when you get to the end of the book, there's a complete twist on how it turns out. 
Sometimes you're going through life and you're just in one little chapter of your life. And you make all these presuppositions. You make all these assumptions. You know, we're bad about doing that. You know, we have so much limited knowledge, but yet we're so braggadocious or we're so proud to think that we have the solutions when we have so many limited uh, numbers to put into the formula. We wonder why in the world we miscalculate so much. We really don't know as much as what's going on as we think we do. And here you are, you're in one little chapter of your life and you're getting so discouraged and you're getting so despondent. Hey, we're not at the end of the story yet. Just trust God. Don't try to plan and try to connive and try to do like Rachel did and try to manipulate everything. She had motherhood manipulation syndrome, you know. You get this idea and you try to manipulate everything just how you want it and all that kind of stuff. And you've always controlled your children. And even when they're 20 and 30, you're going to control your children. You don't have that idea and mentality. And you look at your life sometimes and you actually think you control your life. If you're a Christian, the Bible tells me, correct me if I'm wrong, it says, what? Know you not that you're bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We're not our own. So it's not our life to plan. It's his life that we are to trust him with. So that one little chapter of her life, I think she's willing to trust God. And thank God we know how the end turns out. What a great story, man. You talk about a romance novel. The book of Ruth is. Yep. Esther and Ruth, the two books in the Bible named after women, are great stories. Uh, great passages of scripture. Great biblical types. You have Esther, which is a... Jewish queen married to a Gentile king. And here you have Ruth, which is a Gentile, married to Boaz, which of course in typologies, Jesus Christ, which would be a type of the church, which in this age is predominantly Gentile, which would be the bride of Christ. What a great type picture we have of our Savior, Jesus Christ, with the kinsman redeemer, and yeah. Ruth as that Gentile, like we were, just, you know, who are we? That we should find favor in his sight. He drops us little handfuls of purpose. Who, do we, who are we that we deserve? Here we are Gentile dogs. Here we are in the most prosperous country in the world. In the most biblical. Even in the apostasy we have in this age. There's more gospel truth going out in this country. Than any other place in the world still. I mean if you can't get the gospel in America. Something's wrong with you. What a blessing man that we were born here. I thank God, and I'm not, you know, in the, against anything of our northern friends, but I thank God I was born in the south. Hallelujah. <laughs> I should have played Dixie for you on the banjo there. I mean, I'm telling you, we had a lot of the gospel down here. Right. Of course, it's a sad tragedy when you see the gospel gone to seed like it is in our land. Amen. We were talking about that last night. You know, the, the buckle of the Bible belt here is just full of all apostasy. It's, just, it's sad. But here's Ruth. Boy, she didn't know she was going to be this great type pitcher and be in the lineage of Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing. Years ago, there was an artist and he was painting. And his friend came over. And he said, come here, I want you to show you what I'm working on. And uh, you know how artists and musicians are always kind of a little bit weird anyway. You know, People that are on the artsy side, they're just a little bit different. Well, hey, I'm a musician. <laughs> Watch that. This artist, he was working on this thing, you know, and he had his buddy said, come over and check it out, you know, and they go in and here's this paint scattered everywhere and, and he's, you know, just got paint all over him and he's got his canvas there and it's just a mass of colors and it's just looks discombobulated and everything. And he's like, what do you think? <laughs> and his friend's like, uh, okay, I don't know. And he's like, oh, okay. He goes, I'll tell you what's the matter. You're looking at it. You're, you're seeing it as it is. But I'm seeing it as it's going to be. When the Lord looks down at you and me, we're in the middle of this mess. We're right in the middle of the chapter. We've gone through tragedy and we're just reacting. We don't know what we're saying. Sometimes we don't know what we're doing. We've got to find somebody to trust and somebody to follow and leaning on this and leaning on that. And we're just all foggy and we're confused and, 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 and we're, we're just, we're, we just need mercy. And, and you see us as we are. We are a mess. But God looks and says, I see them as they're going to be. I've got a great plan for you. And all these things are planned out for Ruth, and she doesn't even know it. But one thing about it, 
She had her mind made up. If we can just get our mind made up that we're going to trust the Lord, just real simple, just trust God. Do what we're supposed to do for today. You know, I think it takes a lot of pressure off of us. You know, I think we, we got saved by grace, but we want to live by works, don't we? I mean, we do. We, put the, we have these little checklists of all these things. If I do this, this, and this, then I'll be spiritual. I can prove that I'm spiritual if I do this and this. And we come up with all these pressures and we put these things on us and we begin to plan and we begin to plot our own life and we're not trusting God at all. We're not looking for the open doors at all. We're kicking down the doors. We're making the doors. We're trying to make our own lives to justify ourselves and prove that we're spiritual. Anybody else like that or is it just me? I think we can take a lot of pressure off if we'll just get a steadfast mind. You know what the Lord wants us to do? I know you got all these lists. You know, I need to witness. I need to pray. I need to read my Bible. I need to preach on the street. I need to come to church. I need... You know what the Lord wants you to do? Let's just simplify it. He wants you to love Jesus Christ. Amen. If you can love Jesus Christ with your whole mind, heart, and soul, then all that other stuff will take care of itself. She had a made-up mind. Joshua, same thing. Joshua 24, he says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. That's for me and my house. Amen. I've already made up my mind. He says, We're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Young man in our church recently, he, uh, had, he was like 17, I guess. We got some good young men, good young people in our church. It's a blessing when you see young people begin to blossom into what God wants them to be. All kids don't have to turn out bad. I know some of them do. And I'm not saying you blame the parents and blame everybody. I know every one of us will give account of himself to God. Some of them turn out bad, some of them turn out good. But it is a blessing when you see a young person begin to read the Bible on their own. Not just because mom and daddy tell them to. But they begin to grow on their own. You know what I mean? They start loving Jesus on their own. And you begin to see them make some decisions on their own. Some conviction. A young man told me he went to apply for a job. And he told him, he says, I can't work on Sundays. That was his conviction. He just already made up his mind. This is, this is where I'm going to draw the line right here. Because of my fellowship with God, I know I need to be in church. Not because church is the, the holy grail, but because church facilitates my fellowship with Jesus Christ. I can worship Him in spirit and in truth because I come in church and I get fed. And then I go out into the world. Yeah, we're supposed to worship on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You go out into the world and you live out what you do in here. We come in church and this is the huddle. We go out there and we make the plays on the field. Amen. And so this young man, he had already made up his mind. Okay, these are, this is the, these are the things the Lord wants me to do. So I'm not going to back down on this. If you go ahead and make up your mind, okay, there's going to be time in my life every day, depending on your schedule, whether it's morning, noon, or night, or whatever, that you spend in the Bible and in time, you and God. That needs to be a decision that you go ahead and make, make up. Yes. Instead of like, well, what if I'm going to read my Bible this morning? What if i got time to read the Bible? Or It's like some people get up and they're like, are we going to church today? Man, it sure is a nice day. It'd be a nice day to get the boat out, wouldn't it? Well, I really need to work on that, that project in the backyard, you know. Boss said I can come in and get some overtime. You know, we can pay more bills. We can get the bills paid off. Then we can start tithing. <laughs> yeah, you know that one. You, know, get, you can get all this done, and then you can start doing what you're supposed to do. You know how that rolls. Moses made up his mind. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the sin, pleasure of sin for a season. Jesus Christ. Bible says he was steadfastly set to go up to Jerusalem. He made up his mind to go to the cross. I'll close with this story. Years ago, there was a ocean liner that was wrecked off the New England coast. And they had the Coast Guard there. There was one of the old veteran Coast Guard captains. And he got the young guys together and said, look, we got to go. And it was one of the most awful storms. Matter of fact, that Coast Guard, that old veteran, he said, I've never seen a storm like this. And some of the younger guys there, they said, Captain, should we go out? He said, they said, Captain, should we go out? We might not make it back. He said, look, we have to go out. We don't have to come back. Amen. We got to go out. You see, some things define you. 
that officer on the street, he puts on that uniform. He puts on that badge, and that badge represents the civil authority of every single tax-paying citizen. That badge represents the community of social order. I believe in that thin blue line. I'm telling you, I know law enforcement. We've had a lot of law enforcement in our church. Uh, the sheriff of our community, he passed away. He was a member of our church, and we had a lot of law enforcement. We had some uh, young man in our church. He got killed in the line of duty. I really believe that thin blue line is the difference between peace and chaos in our society. Yes, it is. If every police officer went on strike within 24 hours, you would be protecting your house with your own guns from people coming into your house. I guarantee you. That police officer, he puts on that badge. You know what he does? He submits under that authority, and he identifies with what he has already committed himself to do. When you go to work, some of you probably have badges that you clock in with, or you have maybe uniforms that you wear, or however the, the, the thing is with your particular job, nurses and doctors and things, you see them with their uniform. They get, my, they get in that mindset, and they are in that position. So that defines what they are to do. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says we are to put on Christ Amen. every day. We get up, we put off the old man, yep. and we put on the new man. And you know what we say? We say, you know, I'm a Christian. That means I'm supposed to do today what a Christian is supposed to do. Yes. Let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So the fact that I'm a Christian is going to make all my choices for me. I don't have to come to the crossroads like Orpah and Ruth and say, should I go this way or should I go back? I come to the road and I say, well, I'm a Christian, so this is the only choice. My mind's already made up to do what Jesus wants me to do. Is your mind made up tonight? I hope it is. If it is, I want to encourage you. Set your face like a flint. Don't change your mind. Don't let the devil change your mind. I know the times change, but we don't need to change our mind. We're too late in the game. Amen. Too many, like the song says, there's too many miles behind us. Too many yeah. sunsets have done gone through. We, we can't stop now. If you've got a made-up mind, I want you to encourage you to keep that made-up mind. Some of you, maybe you're kind of in the tunnel and you're being pulled from this way and that way. You're not completely committed. Why don't you just let go and let God have his way in your life tonight? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the great passage.